Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in around five minutes, although today's is quite extensive, so we'll see what the length ends up being. We kick off today with a little bit more information about this new model that Apple has been teasing that they're calling Realm. It seems like it's a key part of their strategy to make a new Siri, which is desperately and by far and away the thing that the AI community is most looking for out of any sort of future Apple AI announcements. Realm stands for Reference Resolution as Language Modeling, and as Tom's Guide puts it, it's designed to run on a phone and make voice assistants like Siri smarter by helping it understand context and ambiguous references. So part of the thing that Realm does is that it can take information from the screen while the person is using the assistant. Again, from Tom's Guide, it's a visual model that reconstructs the screen and labels each on-screen entity and its location. This creates a text-based representation of the visual layout, which can be passed on to the voice assistant to provide it context clues for users' requests. The authors of the paper said that this new approach, despite the model being smaller, has it outperforming even bigger models like GPT-4 on certain queries. The authors of the paper wrote, We especially wish to highlight the gains on on-screen datasets and find that our model with the texture encoding approach is able to perform almost as well as GPT-4 despite the latter being provided with screenshots. Now, of course, one of the things that we're waiting to figure out is exactly what the breakdown of Apple native AI versus Apple partnered AI with companies like Google will be. We've heard reports that Apple is in conversations with Google to put Gemini in the new iOS operating system. And so where exactly those lines will be drawn remains a little bit to be figured out. Next up, the latest open letter to rock the AI world, literally in this case. More than 200 musicians, including Billie Eilish, Nicki Minaj, Stevie Wonder, Jay Balvin, along with the estates of Frank Sinatra and Bob Marley, have all signed an open letter pleading with tech firms not to develop AI tools that could replace them. The letter came from a group called the Artist Rights Alliance. It reads, We, the undersigned members of the artist and songwriting communities, call on AI developers, technology companies, platforms, and digital music services to cease the use of AI to infringe upon and devalue the rights of human artists. They say the assault on human creativity must be stopped. We must protect against the predatory use of AI to steal professional artists' voices and likenesses, violate creators' rights, and destroy the music ecosystem. Now, there are tons of artists that you will know and have heard of on this list. It is definitely not an insignificant group of people. But what's interesting is that the media is, shockingly, not reporting as nuanced as the letter actually is. Let's get more specific. The letter reads... Make no mistake, we believe that when used responsibly, AI has enormous potential to advance human creativity and in a manner that enables the development and growth of new and exciting experiences for music fans everywhere. Unfortunately, some platforms and developers are employing AI to sabotage creativity and undermine artists, songwriters, musicians, and rights holders. When used irresponsibly, AI poses enormous threats to our ability to protect our privacy, our identities, our music, and our livelihoods. Some of the biggest and most powerful companies are, without permission, using our work to train AI models. These efforts are directly aimed at replacing the work of human artists with massive quantities of AI-created sounds and images that substantially dilute the royalty pools that are paid out to artists. For many working musicians, artists, and songwriters who are just trying to make ends meet, this would be catastrophic. Unchecked, AI will set in motion a race to the bottom that will degrade the value of our work and prevent us from being fairly compensated for it. So basically, this is the standard complaint from creatives. They don't want AI trained against their work that is then used to replace them. Ultimately, as we've discussed so many times on this show, this is a conversation that is going to bridge from, on the one hand, legal, and will be determined in courts when it comes to questions of fair use and copyright when it comes to training, but it's also a societal question and a market question. It's inevitable that there are going to be a huge amount of AI-generated music in the future. The impact that that will have on existing musicians and the way in which that comes to bear remains to be seen. Now, heading into a different dimension of AI risk and safety, the U.S. and the U.K. have signed a new agreement, the first big bilateral treaty, on information sharing around AI safety testing. The deal was signed by the U.K. Science Minister Michelle Donnellan and the U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. The Financial Times writes, The agreement will specifically enable the U.K.'s new AI Safety Institute set up in November and its U.S. equivalent, which is yet to begin its work, to exchange expertise through secondments of researchers from both countries. The institutes will also work together on how to independently evaluate private AI models built by the likes of OpenAI and Google. To me, the substance of the deal is less important than the fact that it exists. Commerce Secretary Raimondo said that AI was the, quote, defining technology of our generation. She continued, Our partnership makes clear that we aren't running away from these concerns, we're running at them. Speaking of running at AI full throttle, the Wall Street Journal today reports on how business schools in America are, as they put it, going all in on AI. 
They point to examples like American University's Kogod School of Business, which has created or adapted 20 classes from forensic accounting to marketing all around AI. And interestingly, one of the things that you're starting to see here is something that I wish would happen more broadly in education, which is educators viewing AI not as a cheating tool that they can somehow beat, but as a new reality and a new tool that students are going to use and that they thus have to adapt to. They cover, for example, the story of Robert Bray, writing, When Robert Bray, who teaches operations management at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management, realized that ChatGPT could answer nearly every question in the textbook he uses for his data analytics course, he updated the syllabus. Last year, he started to focus on teaching coding using large language models, and enrollment jumped from 21 MBA students to 55. Before, engineers had an edge against business graduates because of their technical expertise, but now MBAs can use AI to compete in that zone. Bray encourages his students to offload as much work as possible to AI, treating it like a really proficient intern. Like I said, I think that this is the right attitude in general for educators to treat this like the force that it is, something that is not going to be put back in the bottle, and something that enables us and requires us to design completely different types of educational experiences. Now, one area where AI is not being as welcomed is in the courtroom. A Washington state trial judge has banned the use of AI-enhanced video as evidence in the trial of a man accused of killing three people. Wrote Judge Leroy McCullough, This court finds that admission of this AI-enhanced evidence would lead to a confusion of the issues and a muddling of eyewitness testimony and could lead to a time-consuming trial within a trial about the non-peer-reviewable process used by the AI mode. Basically, in this situation, a shooting that killed three people in Des Moines was caught on a cell phone. Obviously, that means that the video quality is somewhat low. Because of that, lawyers for the defendant wanted to use AI to enhance the video, but the prosecutors argued that AI enhancement software is not necessarily meant to reflect the truth, but to just make video more visually appealing. This might be the first ruling of its kind, but it will certainly not be the last time this issue comes up. Speaking of issues and resolution, you may remember recently when a set of podcast hosts trained an AI algorithm on George Carlin's work to produce a new George Carlin special that they called I'm Glad I'm Dead. This arose the ire of the Carlin estate, and now the parties have apparently settled, with effectively the podcast hosts agreeing to take the content down and never do anything with George Carlin again. Now, one thing to note is that these folks weren't trying to trick anyone into thinking it was actually George Carlin. Indeed, the presentation began, Hello, my name is Dudzi, and I'm a comedy AI. I just want to let you know very clearly that what you're about to hear is not George Carlin. It's my impression of George Carlin that I developed in the exact same way a human impressionist would. Yet that was not enough for Carlin's family, and so they filed suit in January. Lastly today, the talent battle in AI continues to be intense. Fortune covered recent departures from Meta AI, with three high-profile engineers leaving not for other AI companies but to start their own things. And the former head of developer relations for OpenAI, Logan Kilpatrick, has just announced that he's joined Google to lead product for their AI studio. I think people naturally feel that the flow from big companies like Google to smaller startups like OpenAI, although of course OpenAI is no longer a small company, is the more natural state. So when things go the other direction, people take notice. I think probably more than any other big trend, the reality is just that well-positioned people in this AI space are going to have lots and lots of job opportunities. And so, hey, not a bad thing to learn about. But that will do it for this extended brief. Next up, the main AI breakdown. 